Welcome to Five Books for Catholics, where an expert selects and explains five outstanding books in some aspect of Catholic life, doctrine, or culture. G. E. M. Anscombe, or simply Elizabeth Anscombe, lived from 1919 to 2001. She was one of the most important analytical philosophers of the second half of the 20th century. During her early teens, she read a 19th century Jesuit textbook on natural theology. This book sparked her interest in philosophy. It also contributed to her conversion to Catholicism in her late teens. While studying at Oxford, she met and married Peter Geach. The couple went on to have seven children. During her postgraduate studies at Cambridge, she studied under Ludwig Wittgenstein and befriended him. The Austrian philosopher named her as one of the three literary executors of his unpublished manuscripts. Anscombe taught at Somerville College, Oxford, and in 1970 was elected Professor of Philosophy at the University of Cambridge. She authored influential papers on a range of philosophical issues, whereas her book Intention is a seminal work on the philosophy of action. She was also a committed Catholic, who stood up for her principles in public and was a staunch supporter of Humani Vitae, Paul VI's encyclical on contraception. Some of her public protests against murder by unjust warfare or abortion are renowned. In this interview, Roger Teichman discusses Anscombe and her works. Roger Teichman is lecturer in philosophy at St Hilda's College, Oxford. His research interests are ethics, philosophy of language, philosophy of mind, Wittgenstein, and Elizabeth Anscombe. His books include The Philosophy of Elizabeth Anscombe, published by Oxford University Press, Nature, Reason, and the Good Life, also published by Oxford University Press, Wittgenstein on Thought and Will, from Rutledge, and Logos and Life, Essays on Mind, Action, Language, and Ethics. He has edited Elizabeth Anscombe, Critical Assessments of Leading Philosophers, in four volumes and published by Rutledge, the Oxford Handbook of Elizabeth Anscombe, and is co-editor of The Moral Philosophy of Elizabeth Anscombe. The five books he's recommended are Intention by Anscombe, Second, Ethics, Religion and Politics, Collected Philosophical Papers, Volume 3, by Anscombe, Third, Faith in a Hard Grant, Essays on Religion, Philosophy and Ethics by G. E. M. Anscombe, edited by Mary Geach and Luke Gormley. Fourth, The Philosophy of Elizabeth Anscombe by Roger Teichman. And fifth, The Woman Erupt to Something by Benjamin J. B. Lipscomb. The links to these books can be found in the show notes. And if you have a moment, please also support this podcast by leaving a top review on the platform of your choice. Professor Roger Teichman, welcome. Hello. What are the main details of Anscombe's life and career? Uh, <clears throat> well, in a, uh, in a nutshell, um, the main details of her life and career. Uh, she, well, she had a very interesting life. She was um, uh, a convert to Catholicism. She's not, um, in other words, she was not one of the homegrown sort. Her parents were uh, Anglicans, and uh, but she found um, uh, Catholicism in her teens on account of reading various. She was a voracious reader, I think, um, uh, in her teens and youth. And she, among the other, among other things that she read, were a couple of books by uh, Jesuits, uh, or at least one was by a Jesuit. Uh, which introduced her both to um, Catholic thinking and also more generally to philosophy, as she later explained. And uh, it was through reading those books, as I say, that she felt the pull to Rome and her parents were not at all pleased uh, initially or perhaps ever. Um, indeed, they tried to get her, they, they brought round an Anglican priest to try and dissuade their 14 year old or however she, old she was from taking this step, um, but the uh, the priest, the vicar, failed completely. Um, 
And when she went up to Oxford, which she went, did uh, um, uh, in, let me think, in about uh, my maths is awful. She was born in 1919. Uh, so in 38, she went up, or 37, 38, she went up to um, read classics, or as it's called in Oxford, literary humaniores. She went to St. Hugh's College, and um, while, as I say, while, while an undergraduate, she uh, took the step of being accepted into, um, of having instruction and being accepted into the church, despite the threats of her parents to cut her off without a penny, which and she called their bluff, and they didn't, of course. But um, So she became a Catholic uh, as, a, as a student at Oxford, and also as a student at Oxford met a uh, man who would be her husband, Peter Geach, uh, an another convert. Uh, his, his life is also an interesting one. They went on to have seven children, um, and uh, apart from anything else, um, the extraordinary capacity that Anscombe had to continue working and reading and lecturing, uh, and indeed going back and forth between Oxford and Cambridge, uh, while um, bearing and bringing up seven children. This is one of the things that friends and, and colleagues remarked upon, and it took an enormous energy, obviously. And she was a woman of great uh, energy, uh, or perhaps I should say um, strength, strength of will and strength of um, physical and uh, um, intellectual strength. Um, so, yes, uh, the other, imp so perhaps the two main strands one might bring out in her intellectual uh, biography are, first of all, what I've been talking about, her Catholicism, uh, and secondly, of course, her acquaintance with Ludwig Wittgenstein. So should I say a little about that? Yes. Yes. Well, uh, she she read Wittgenstein's early, uh, uh, well, Wittgenstein, an Austrian philosopher, uh, one of the greatest of modern philosophers, if not the greatest, uh, only published, uh, only, as you might say, brought out two books. Uh, namely the Tractatus, or in its full title, the Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus, uh, which uh, came out in around 1921. Um, so the Tractatus, uh, the work of a young man, um, and the second book, which we can say he brought out, was, of course, The Philosophical Investigations, which I'll come to in a moment. Um, and apart from that, he, he, let, he, he wrote enormous amount of stuff in notebooks. We'll come on to that in a moment. But so uh, Anscombe encountered the Tractatus uh, probably um, as a student, as I say, up at Oxford, uh, and was immediately fascinated by it. Um, and she first met Wittgenstein probably in 1942, and um, uh, um, by going to his lectures in Cambridge. Uh, and this developed into uh, um, a close philosophical uh, friendship, one might say. So, in fact, recently I've been um, editing uh, the reminiscences of Wittgenstein, which which Anscombe left, um, and which should be found in her archive, which are a fasc is a fascinating document, um, and it indicates how many conversations and how uh, they had together. Um, so their lives became, for about a decade, their lives uh, were rather entwined. Um, she, she went to his lectures and classes, uh, at a, and um, he, would, he, would, he, he would often visit, I mean, when their friendship became, uh, when they became closer friends, he would uh, drop in to see her and Peter Geach uh, and the young family that they were starting to bring up. When he was uh, in his last years, in the late 40s or about 1950, um, he got ill um, with the illness that would finally kill him. But uh, it was around then that he actually moved in with Anscombe in uh, 27 St. John Street, Oxford. Uh, and there he, in fact, he, he was, he was <coughs> taking hormonal treatment for cancer and he decided to stop that um, around this time because it, it was interfering with his thinking and 
he wants to think about everything else. So when <coughs> when living with Anstom, he was actually writing some of the most important last uh, philosophy um, that I what was to be published posthumously as uncertainty. But, got, but okay, so the, perhaps the key thing to say about Anscom uh, and Wittgenstein's um, um, uh, published works is that she was one of three philosophers whom he designated to be his literary executors. She and Rush Reese and Georg von Wright. Uh, they, the three of them, were his literary executors, and she it was who translated was the, the, the one who did most of the translating. She'd learnt German, she was a very fine linguist, and she she learnt German, and she actually went as far as going to stay in in Vienna at Wittgenstein's uh, recommendation, so she could learn the sort of Viennese German that was his German, uh, which would enable her the better to translate his works. So over the after his death, over the coming, uh, over the next years and uh, decades, in fact, um, all his Nachlass, or m m most of his Nachlass, much of his Nachlass was brought out under the aegis of Anscombe and uh, the other two executives, mainly Anscombe. Uh, and as I say, she translated. She was the main translator. So it's her translation of the Philosophical Investigations, which is his second magnum opus, uh, was the standard translation until just, and still is actually, the standard translation. <coughs> and hasn't been um, supplemented. Uh, that wasn't the only work. There was uncertainty on colour, um, the earlier stuff, philosophical grammar, and so on. Some of these are translated by um, others, but most of it by Anscombe. So uh, yes, so the, 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 perhaps the two strands, as I say, which one might uh, bring out in talking about her intellectual biography is first of all her Catholicism, and secondly her association with Wittgenstein. Through your mother, you knew Anscombe and her family as a child. Uh, at university, you attended her lectures. What impression did she make upon you? And do you have any memorable experiences? <coughs> yes, indeed. <coughs> well, as you say, my, uh, my, I knew Anscombe personally really through my mother. My mother had been taught by Anscombe in the, in the 1950s because my mother was doing the, the B-Phil in Oxford. <coughs> and um, Anscombe was her main supervisor. And... Uh, so they formed a, um, an intellectual friendship. When my and then my mother, somewhat later, went to Cambridge, took up a job in 1967 uh, in Cambridge at Newhall, as it then was. It's now called Murray Edwards College. And then a, a few years later, uh, Anscombe took up the professorship in Cambridge uh, and was based at the same college as my mother. Um, so that was in 1970, and thereupon they renewed their friendship and uh, Anscombe would quite often come around to our house and my mother would often often take me and my brother around to the, uh, the Geech Anscombe household uh, and so I was often and frankly I was often eavesdropping these philosophical conversations which were going on between especially between my mother and Anscombe <clears throat> but also I got to know the younger generation um, uh, as I said Anscombe and Geech had seven children I got to know several of those. But they're all somewhat older than me, but I ended up knowing a lot of them pretty well. And then when I was uh, an undergraduate, uh, I decided to do read philosophy at Cambridge. At Cambridge, you could just do pure philosophy. I was uh, zealous about philosophy, didn't want to mix it with other things, as you have to, for example, in Oxford. <coughs> um, so I attended, as you said, some of Anscombe's last lectures. Um, she retired in 1984, or was it five, or well, thereabouts, anyway. Um, we can, I haven't got a good head for dates, but I can give you the exact dates subsequently. But she would, I, I um, went to a number of her lectures, uh, as I say, um, in the early 80s, just before her retirement. Um, many stories <laughs> uh, exist about Anscombe, quite a few are true. Um, I uh, now you said what general impression, um, and I, this of course means the impression that she had on me over, you know, from my childhood really, uh, through until her death. Frankly, um, she uh, uh, 
what, what should we what, what should one mention in particular or primarily? She was obviously intensely intelligent, uh, and um, uh, her lectures were rather like Wittgenstein's. <coughs> Wittgenstein's. They were in no way um, read off notes or uh, over prepared, or and, and they were completely unlike the lectures that that would be given today in any university, including Cambridge or Oxford. Um, of course, there was no PowerPoint. There was a blackboard, I remember, and sometimes she would scribble something on the blackboard if the fancy took. But she was really somewhat like because I'm thinking, I wouldn't say they were unprepared, these lectures, but she was largely thinking aloud, thinking through um, what was on her mind, at the same time as uh, keeping, um, unlike because then she, she was more uh, able to keep to whatever um, topic that lectures were meant to be on for the sake of the students studying that particular topic. Um, as you perhaps know, Wittgenstein, when asked what he was, what, how to advertise his philosophy lectures, had, after a pause, simply said, just put philosophy. So every year he lectured in Cambridge. Uh, all you knew was that you were going to hear Wittgenstein uh, thinking and talking about philosophy. Anscombe lectured on more specific things. She, uh, she lectured, I remember, uh, on Aristotle. Uh, and Plato and uh, causality. I remember going to a series of her lectures on causality, which is very interesting. Uh, she, um, as well as being obviously extremely uh, intellectually um, engaged and, and uh, as it were, I don't think she stopped philosophizing. There's a sense in which uh, she could she could go on talking philosophy um, for hours. Um, there are various anecdotes about this. In other words, she wasn't the sort of professional philosopher who only does it in, in lectures or uh, when they're on the job. You know, she, she, there wasn't a, a, a really kind of distinction between her general conversation and her philosophical conversation. Um, one, anecdote, one anecdote I know from Christopher Coop um, uh, is illustrative. Um, I'm sure there are many such stories. Christopher said that he was once talking to Anscon in Oxford. Uh, this was probably in the uh, 50s. Uh, or, mm, it might have been the 60s. Um, anyway, he was talking with Anscombe about philosophy. Uh, he was a student of, of some description, sort of quasi-graduate student. Um, and they talked and talked and about three or four hours had gone by. And uh, Christopher was feeling somewhat exhausted and Anselm said, I'm so sorry, we're going to have to, I realise I have a dental appointment um, uh, at such and such a time, in, in, you know, within the next quarter of an hour. Uh, and Christopher said, oh, well, that's fine, we'll, we'll call us a day then. She said, no, 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 we, we can carry on talking. Um, so she led him off down the street, you know, to the dentists, all the, all the while continuing their discussion. Uh, and... He said, oh, well, I'll, I'll leave you here. No, no, and he went into the waiting room with her and she was still, you know, until the very last minute uh, before the dentist said, uh, Miss Anscombe, please. Uh, she was continuing this discussion. That was very typical of her to forget time, as you might say. Uh, um, and that was also, uh, when, I, when I talked earlier about having seven children and her capacity nevertheless to continue her work and so on, um, uh, she did have a capacity to, I wouldn't say forget what was going on around her, but to, you know, be able to put it as a distance. Um, uh, if there were children running around screaming, she was able to you know, zone out and, and carry, you know, she had a power of concentration, in other words, which was very important and useful. Um, uh, I'm not saying that she neglected her children, on the contrary, she, it was a very tight-knit family, though very unconventional, it must be said, um, the way that she and Peter um, brought up their children was, was sometimes looked askance at by more uh, conventional types. Um, and I remember an atmosphere, I must say, when, when I was going, when I went round as a child, an atmosphere of um, liberty, let's say, uh, which seemed to pervade the household, and which, which I, had, I was not acquainted with, not that I had a strict upbringing, um, particularly, but uh, I did feel as if anything could happen <laughs> for this. Um, yeah. And uh, Anselm's key husband, as you already mentioned, Peter Gitch, was an influential philosopher in his own right. He specialised in logic, known for his scholarship in Frege, 
his contributions to metaethics and for seminal papers that bridge analytical philosophy and Thomas Aquinas. Moreover, the couple co-authored three philosophers. Did Geach influence Anscombe's thought or did the two simply share the same general philosophical outlook? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, they were clearly very much, they were very uh, of a mind and, and, and shared a lot of their interests and proclivities and tendencies of thought. Um, uh, at the same time, they were very different. If you read their, uh, if you read their works, you, you, you could immediately tell whether you're reading Geach or reading Anscombe. Um, Geach's mo mode of philosophy was, was, I mean, his style of writing was, was clarity and precision, uh, and. Um, I suppose one might liken him in a way to Frege, his great hero, um, who also wrote with such clarity and precision. Um, Anscombe's writing uh, is denser, um, more elusive, uh, and you can perhaps hear uh, or, or, or see the influence of Wittgenstein in that, um, really delve. In. And she said herself once, but I, I'll answer your question, um, influence across the thing is, of course, they they met when they were both very young. I mean, when they were about twenty, uh, and um, and were obviously thinking and talking together a great deal. So uh, they they read a lot of the same stuff. They read Aquinas. They both read Aquinas. They both read um, Wittgenstein. I mean, she she was obviously the main producer of the Wittgenstein text, but uh, Geach, uh, as you might say, found himself reading. Uh, a lot of Wittgenstein as a result. Um, they had shared philosophical acquaintances like Anthony Kenny. Um, uh, <coughs> they talked, they must have talked together an enormous amount. Um, so I think influence would be a slightly odd word to use. Uh, they were batting around ideas between them. Um, so it'd be odd in a way if, if uh, uh, that there wasn't quite a large overlap of, of, of theme and direction. But as I say, the, the, actually their mindset, their, their minds were very different. Um, uh, and this comes out in the way they, they write. Mary Geach, their daughter, once asked her mother, uh, uh, as, a, as a girl, she said, Mummy, which, which is the better philosophy, you or Papa? Um, and this is recorded in one of uh, Mary Geach's um, written introductions uh, to her mother's posthumous uh, papers, which I can dig out. But her mother said something like, your father uh, uh, can can get, I am not, this is not verbatim, and I should really get it verbatim for you, um, but the quote is something like, your, your father, Peter Geach, um, home, he, he can hone in on, uh, home in on, uh, um, uh, a topic, dig deep into it in a focused way, whereas I um, am better at looking around and, 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 and being, uh, and, as it were, uh, looking at the surrounding territory of the problem. And, and, and I will get the verbatim quote, but, but it's rather a re it, it is rather a realistic um, assessment, I think, that Anscombe gave to her daughter. There's a variety of views on whether the Christian faith and reason are compatible with one another. The Catholic Church has declared dogmatically that they are compatible, albeit with certain truths of faith being inaccessible to reason working by its own lights. How did Anscombe construe the relation between our work as a philosopher and our Catholic faith? Uh, very good question. I mean, so she uh, took the line you mentioned, which uh, which was that there are many truths uh, you know, for example, in ethics, which um, which must be and are um, accessible to um, rational thought, whether or not one um, is a Christian, uh, in including things which are terribly important in Christianity. Um, so, I take it she was a, a Thomist in that in that sense. Um, uh, in her work, she she was. It does make a difference whether something that she's writing is addressed to Catholics or not. And when you read, um, for example, a, a lot of the essays in 
one of the volumes I'm going to mention, Faith in the Hard Ground. Uh, the, the, when addressing Catholics, of course, she can um, take for granted a lot, uh, uh, a, a lot of shared uh, notions and beliefs, uh, which she doesn't and can't do when writing it for a more general philosophical audience. So the two kinds of article, two kinds of writing um, are, are different in that respect, though, of course, they're very similar because they they show the same Anscomian uh, disentangling of, of philosophical issues and, and profound thought. Um, uh, so I, I think, in, but in answer to the question whether she thought there was any tension, no, I mean, she, would, she would have said there's philosophizing uh, and thinking about religion are not distinct activities. Um, and indeed, sometimes in her more general philosophical articles, she will, uh, she will overtly raise issues about what Christianity says um, as backing up or illustrating or uh, for the reader to um, consider it in the light of her arguments. Most people do not read works of philosophy. How would you encourage people to read Anscombe? <laughs> people who aren't philosophers? Yes, the general reader. Yes, well, uh, that's a good question. Um, well, would you encourage them to read Anscombe? <laughs> uh, to dive in. Um, I mean, why not? Uh, there's, it, it, with philosophy, there's always, you, you can dive into Kant as well. Um, and uh, she is one of those philosophers whom, sorry, who will, who will appear, and because she is difficult uh, to a lay person. Um, in contrast, let's say to, let's say David Hume or uh, A.J. Eyre, sometimes the comprehensibility of a, the, you know, the easy read, um, aspect of a philosopher might be misleading. I mean, I mentioned A.J. Eyre, he, 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 he's very readable, or Bertrand Russell. Um, both of them wrote, you know, hoping to be read by non-philosophers. Uh, sometimes, sometimes, um, the fact that it's so easy, it seems to, you know, flow in so, uh, oh, the steps follow so naturally one from the other, um, might on occasion be a consequence of, of not noticing the depth you know, uh, or the, the problematic uh, um, uh, quagmire to your left or right. Um, Anscombe, like Wittgenstein, was you know, absolutely, in, her integrity would not allow her to to make a, a problem simple, which she regarded as clearly um, uh, porcupine-like in its complexity. So, uh, so she's not she's not an easy read, and. Um, uh, Partly because of her, you know, as I say, her desire to be absolutely frank with herself and the reader about the complexities and the difficulties in a philosophical problem. And partly because a lot of her articles, she just dives in. She doesn't give the reader any background uh, or sort of uh, telling them where this is coming from. She quite often starts at the point of where her own thoughts are uh, and just dives in. Um, and that, of course, makes things difficult. If, if somebody were curious about Anscombe, as I say, well, what, what, what would be a good place to start? Um, maybe modern, maybe the famous article, Modern Moral Philosophy. Um, and even if you don't get every uh, nuance, that gives you a strong sense of her um, intellectual and also um, uh, not only her intellectual seriousness, but her, her moral seriousness. And, and indeed, it's a in some ways, it's a, it's a polemical work, and she did certainly have a polemical aspect. We can talk about that a bit. Um, so, it would, it, modern moral philosophy would perhaps be a, uh, a good place to start, giving you a, a taste of, of what sort of a woman she was, as well as what sort of philosopher she was. The first book you've chosen is Intention. It's often credited with launching the philosophy of action as a self-standing field. What's the significance and importance of this work? Well, um, she wrote it, it began as a, a series of lectures uh, she gave in Oxford in 1957 and, or six, um, and uh, 
why was she interested in intention? It's her, her daughter says, and it seems this, this is perfectly true that um, Anscombe got particularly interested in intention and um, associated themes because of the uh, um, issue surrounding President Truman. The previous in 1956, Oxford offered uh, Harry Truman um, an honorary doctorate, something that uh, Oxford often does for, for the great and the good. Uh, Harry Truman, of course, had dropped atom bombs or had ordered the, the uh, atom bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And for that reason, Anscombe regarded him as responsible for uh, terrible massacres of innocent people. And famously, she um, she protested as a member of the uh, Oxford Congregation, uh, as it's called, um, the Body of Dons. She, she got up a protest against the um, awarding to Truman of uh, of an honorary degree. Um, and according to Mary Geach, it was largely or partly, at least partly, thinking about uh, issues concerning what, who intended what, what it was to intend something. Had Harry Truman, I mean, one might say all he did was sign a piece of paper. He didn't kill anyone. Um, uh, so issues about intention and responsibility and, and what, what can count as your own, as ascribable to you. Uh, in other words, ethical concerns were evidently important for her wanting to go deeper into the question of intention. But um, this isn't to say there's there's any there's much ethics to be found in in, in the uh, monograph intention. It really is a, a sustained and um, uh, detailed uh, investigation of of a whole bunch of um, concepts uh, in, connected to intention, intentionalness, uh, action, um, and, but it is the, but that, is, but the topic of intention and, and philosophy of action, which as you say, she basically kickstarted um, in, uh, modern philosophy of action, um, is, a, is a topic with, with many connections. It connects with ethics, as you said, uh, connects with the philosophy of mind, um, mind and body, you know, how whether that old distinction uh, can be sustained. It connects with our knowledge of the future, because in an expression of intention, I seem to be predicting something. I, I'll see you tonight at eight o'clock. Um, how do I know? Um, do I know? Um, and so on. So knowledge and knowledge of the future, mind and body, ethics, it, it, it's a very fecund um, theme intention and, and I think she she sensed that and being a very versatile philosopher she was able to to delineate a lot of these different strands all in one very short book yes uh. thank you for listening to read or listen to the rest of this interview and gain full access to our archive visit fivebooksforcatholics.com and become a premium subscriber if you've enjoyed this episode please subscribe to the podcast and give it a top rating on the platform of your choice. That way more people can discover it. You can also support the podcast and help us produce more interviews like this one by making a one-off donation via the link given in the show notes. As little as one dollar, one pound or one euro can help and will be greatly appreciated. Thank you once again and God bless.